All right, Z. Valentine Bardini, also known as Valley, is a distinguished professor of physics at the University of Utah. He received his bachelor's in 69 and PhD in 1979 from Techion Haifa, Israel, the University of Utah Research Award in 1996. Um, I could go on and on, but Vardini has published 460 research articles, uh, holds 10, 10 patents and provisional patents. His research includes optical, electro, electrical, and magnetic properties, organic sem semiconductors, fabrication of organic optoelectronic and spintronic devices. And I could continue to go on, but basically Valley is an awesome guy who worked with my wife and encouraged my wife to get her PhD in physics. And I'm really grateful for you doing that because she came here with all this talent and potential. And I saw that she was able to reach a lot of that potential really in thanks in large part to you. So thanks for coming on the program. Well, thank you too for inviting me. Yeah, I appreciate it. So um, today we want to talk about physics and the progress of physics and the research that happens at the University of Utah that doesn't get a lot of press that I think more people need to know about. And to put this uh, in context, I want to talk about how yesterday we celebrated the 50th anniversary of the lunar landing. And that was the same year that you got your, got your bachelor's degree. Can you talk a little bit about what the environment of you becoming interested in physics was like back then? Well, then uh, nuclear physics was uh, you know, the highlight of physics um, until uh, the Russian put together the research on uh, outer space with Sputnik. Mm-hmm. And then Sputnik caught us completely by surprise. We never imagined that uh, the Russian were so advanced. And so, as you know, the U.S. and other countries started to work 24-7 um, to put together a program to reach um, the moon before the Russian will do that. But uh, behind behind this uh, push was the idea that um, the research towards putting a man on the moon will help a lot in communication and aeronautics and other uh, fields, engineering fields that uh, will be important later on. Yeah. And so I think that... Um, it was a very good decision to push for um, putting a man on the moon. At that time, I was in high school uh, for the, when the Sputnik came out, uh, Russian Sputnik, and then uh, other satellites with a with a dog called Laika. Mm -hmm. And uh, so this was the first animal on <laughs> in space. And... Um, uh, I was so excited about it that I started to uh, collect stamps uh, of, uh, of all kinds of uh, projects, Russian and U.S. projects, towards uh, putting a, a man on, on the moon. And I had an, a complete album. Each uh, time that the project was uh, successful, at that time, either the Russian or the American put together a stamp. Oh yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. So I had a complete ad uh, album of full of stamps uh, for for this uh, project, and at that time when uh, NASA uh, put a man on the moon, I was not in uh, in Israel. I I was traveling after the bachelor degree before uh, before going uh, back to to Israel to continue my uh, military service. Mm -hmm. So this was. Uh, a two months break before before two periods of my life. Which is mandatory in Israel, right? Yes. Everybody has to <clears throat> mm -hmm. At that time, it was three years. Mm -hmm. And uh, so uh, I still remember I was in the airport in Europe, one of the capitals. I think it was Paris. And people were, uh, instead of going uh, for flights, uh, planned flights, they were <laughs> looking 
uh, as a TV with enthusiasm. The same thing happens, of course, when uh, soccer, World War soccer happens. The final, the same thing. Mm -hmm. So people were really enthusiastic about it. Yeah, it was just... I mean, you kind of look back at it now, and it almost seems unbelievable. <laughs> because yeah, people, people still do not believe. Yeah, it. <laughs> people still don't believe it. We had the conversation this morning. These guys aren't sure that it, that, that could have really happened because you go back so long ago, and you're just like, we can't, we couldn't even manage to sustain our space shuttle program and really maintain those space shuttles. It was just becoming too, way too expensive. But to go back, back before um, computers were were small. I mean, computers took up entire rooms that are less powerful than what we carry around in our pocket, and that was the technology we used to get a man on the moon. How was that possible back then? I mean, how? Why do you think that that seemed realistic? when even today that doesn't seem like something we could achieve in the next 10 years? That's a good question. <clears throat> My opinion is that they put a lot of people. So rather than a computer, there are people doing the work of computers. Mm -hmm. And so at that time, the computer was quite slow. And so people could uh, replace them, so to speak, in many ways. So people with... With so you could see I mean, calculating on chalkboards yeah, and things yeah, like that could replace the need for giant computers, calculators, and so on. You could see, I mean, uh, Houston, um, a very famous uh, picture of uh, Houston. We have a problem, you know. Mm -hmm. So, you were maybe 200 people in front of uh, of uh, all computers. Mm -hmm. So they replace computer by people, actually. Wow. And do you think that examining how so many people now are so reliant on computers and technology to solve the problems for us, that in general, people are not able to do as much as they were able to do using their minds 50 years ago? I don't think so. You don't I think mean, so? No, no. I mean, uh, it's like... Um, going back to the Renaissance and telling people you don't have to move forward because uh, something will happen to your body or whatever. Or to go back uh, 110 years ago when the first airplane uh, crossed the Atlantic and say that uh, you know something will happen to you, to your body if you do that. It's an they, they thought something would happen to your body if you crossed the Atlantic oh, on a, you, in an airplane, or if you in went an in an airplane. A, oh, yeah. got it. Or in train, mm -hmm. where something will happen, and so it's an advance, and people are afraid of advances, but people are people, and so they will always use new technology uh, for the benefit of uh, mankind and uh, curiosity of, uh, of human being, mm -hmm. and I don't think. I think it's a powerful, the technology is a powerful means to reach the goal of uh, people. Yeah. Yeah, and it, but it seems like a lot of the technology we have today, while it's an incredible benefit to humanity, it also kind of acts as something like a crutch. Because if you examine what people were able to do and, and just the minds of physicists. Um, and you, you correct me if I'm incorrect, if I'm wrong on this, but it seems like what I'm reading about J James Clerk Maxwell, and we'll, maybe we'll get back to this, but what he was able to do in his mind and, and what he was able to figure out using mostly his brain and, and small experiments just seems to me to be like, so incredibly amazing for that time period without the use of calculators, without the use of any technology to help him along. Do you, do you think that that maybe the, the reliance on technology is kind of a hindrance in teaching science and math? No, uh, I, I don't feel so. Right. Uh, you know, I'm a scientist and... <clears throat> 
I have technology, but it doesn't prevent me to sing. And uh, a good scientist, enthusiastic scientist, sings all the time. I, uh, I eat dinner, I sing. I, uh, I take a bus, I sing. Yeah. Um, it's not uh, that everyday um, activities will prevent me to sing. Yeah. I don't have to go somewhere to be secluded in order to sing. I can be secluded in the bathroom. <laughs> and by taking a shower. And you don't see the that some of your students or students in general have any problem thinking because of the distractions of technology? Well, some, yes. Uh, that's, a, that's a completely different story mm-hmm. or question. Whether, whether a student is um, able to, to be a scientist. Um, over the year, I have about... I've had uh, maybe 60 PhD students. Um, Out of them, statistically, I think only a quarter could be a scientist. Um, Other three quarters are very good physicists, but they are not scientists that invent things. They are kind of engineers. Mm -hmm. And I I heard a statistic recently that and this seems mind-boggling. I, I probably should have checked this before I, I say it, but that in one year, China will graduate as many engineers in their country as we have with PhDs existing in the United States. That that sounds almost unfathomable, but China is graduating so many engineers in, in technology and science do you see that as being a problem for the United States in the in the future? That's a good question. You question uh, population and uh, uh, the size of the population. So in your mind, you put it very simple. Uh, a country with larger population in the long run would be better than a country with small population. I, I don't believe it's correct. Look at Israel. Yeah, that was that. That's, that's kind <laughs> I mean, of what I was uh, thinking. Over there, there are seven million, and uh, there's a powerful technological country. Yeah, why? What would you attribute that to that to? Why? Why are there so many physicists, mathematicians, and gr- just incredible scientists who've come from Israel, as you have? Um, I think it's a it's a peril of being there. You know. The danger of being there. Israel is uh, surrounded by so many enemies, and uh, people are thinking all the time about it. You know, every week or every day there is some uh, happening, mm-hmm. and uh, it's like a like a pressure that uh, it's in back in your mind. That you have to, you have, you have to come to up it. with. You have to accomplish. You have great to, ideas yeah. to protect yourself. Right. Okay. Huh. I haven't thought of it that way. But you, did you feel that growing up that that you needed to develop more science, technology, weaponry to be able to protect your country? I didn't. You didn't feel that. No. At that time, I fell in love with science. Yeah. In general, at that time in high school, I mean, you don't have this pressure. Yeah. What was your initial spark of interest, like that, w- that really got you interested in math and physics? Well, you know, as a as a child, you have this uh, atti- very simple attitude that if you be a scientist, you you can uh, you may be an Einstein. <laughs> yeah. Or. Uh, Maxwell, or, and so uh, reading about those uh, great scientists uh, fertilized my mind. It's like reading uh, Karl May. I don't know if you know this uh, writer. And he, he wrote about uh, visiting all kinds of uh, corners in the globus on Earth, including uh, U.S. and uh, South America, it's a very known uh, writer in Germany, Karl, Karl May. May? How do you spell May? May, M- like May. M-A-Y. M-A-Y, yeah. M-A-Y, okay. 
Kalmai and uh, I'll have to look him up. Yeah, look at that. Uh, he has uh, characters like Old Shatterhand and Vinetu hmm. in the old in the Wild West. So this uh, breeds the uh, imagination of uh, young people. Yeah, I was uh, at that time. I was thinking, wow, if I go up. Um, I'll visit those places. I'll be like uh, Vinetu or Old Shatter and whatever. And then uh, if you learn geography and you see all kind of bizarre names, Kamchatka. Mm-hmm. Right? Kamchatka for me was <laughs> the end of the world. <laughs> but really, I didn't realize that it's, it's really some island or semi-island. Same thing with uh, scientists. Wow, I mean, this guy... How could we invent invented so many so many things? I mean, these beautiful things. And so, uh, as a as a child, you want to adopt and to mimic and to be like them. Mm-hmm. You think that this is fantastic. Yeah. So it was kind of a call to adventure. Is what you're <laughs> yeah. saying. Exactly. And right. you could feel that 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 was that and, was your uh, pull. Uh, in a way, I was I was correct. Mm-hmm. Because uh, being a scientist, uh, you don't have limits of uh, countries or borders and so on. So I visited a lot of places in, on Earth, uh, giving talks or meetings and so on. So I fulfilled uh, the two main goals of uh, of my childhood. One is being scientist and being uh, curious, curiosity. Mm-hmm. And two to visit places. Yeah, I don't think I don't think many Americans understand that if you're a physicist and you end up becoming a scientist, you really do travel the whole world. Yeah, I it's mean, not known. Yeah, I don't. I, it's like uh, it's not known. The Salt Lake City actually it's a jewel. Yeah, it's not known. Yeah, and what what has made Salt Lake City a jewel? Like, how how has the physics program, the material science program at the University of Utah, developed with what? These you've are two done? questions. Well, let's start with <laughs> start yeah, with. Yeah, I uh, mean, Salt Lake City. Uh, I fell in love with it when I came to a meeting. Mm-hmm. It snowbird. It was uh, uh, 1982. 1982, we had a meeting of uh, semiconductors at Snowbird. And I I, uh, I couldn't uh, take my eyes off the beauty, mm-hmm. the nature beauty of, of this place. Uh, then I visited, well, I visited Snowbird and Alta and so on. But then I visited Salt Lake itself and it was uh, a little town, but not bad at all. <laughs> wow. So... Uh, I remember I had a, a friend that moved to Salt Lake City at that time. Uh, he became a professor in physics. Uh, his name is Professor Craig Taylor. Mm-hmm. And uh, I visited him and other people connected with him, and I fell in love with it. Nice. And uh, to now, realistically, it has everything that a big city has. But it, uh, but affordable. Concert, uh, theaters, operas, uh, ski uh, activities, and so on is very affordable. Think about it. You are in New York. You go to see an opera. Fine. Would you take your car? I don't think so. Mm-hmm. Would you take your underground? Maybe, but you are. If you want to really feel special then uh, you take a taxi cab mm-hmm. you know how long do you have to wait for a taxi cab at eight o'clock or seven o'clock in new york city in, at night in the evening yeah. and you know how much it uh, cost a ticket there to to see an opera in uh, new york city uh, i paid 350 bucks wow <laughs> <laughs> and i i uh, said it's the last uh, row no kidding. Right, with wow. my wife, and uh, and here it's uh, forty to fifty bucks you for per ticket, and you see very good opera. Yeah. And concert the same way, theater the same way, uh, restaurant the same way. It's very affordable. People do not understand 
how much effort and pressure is traffic mm-hmm. and how much time you spend in getting to places in a big city. Yeah. So this is uh, what I think about Salt Lake is the jewel. Yeah, I have to agree with you. I, I absolutely love the and, mountains. And people do not, uh, do not know that. It's, not, it's unknown. Yeah, it isn't. And, and it's like Denver's a great city, right? They have a lot of amenities. They have a lot of wonderful things about the city. But you're, you got to drive like two hours to get to the mountains and to go to a secluded mountain place. If you're in downtown Salt Lake City, you can literally walk 10 minutes and get to City Creek Canyon. I agree completely. It's just amazing. And, and every time I go someplace else and examine the city, I, I appreciate what's good about it, but I also always see the shortcomings. It's like, how do you get to nature? How can you compare getting to the wilderness in five, 10 minutes with driving hours sometimes to get? And also the location. Salt Lake City location is a fantastic location. That means I can, in one hour of uh, airplane, getting to Las Vegas, one and a half to Los Angeles, one and a half to Seattle, mm-hmm. one and 20 minutes to San Francisco. So as if, uh, if I am in California. Yeah. I can go there, give a talk, discuss with scientists, come back the same day and eat dinner at home. Yeah. Yeah. Also, the location in terms of uh, altitude. It's well, that's fun. pretty cool. From all the places you could have chosen to do your research, I mean, you had you had a lot of options. You chose Salt Lake City, and obviously, the University of Utah has benefited from that, and it's been it's been great for I guess you and the and the university. And we'll we'll take a little break, and when we get back, let's talk about some of the patents you hold and some of the research that's going on at the U that a lot of people don't know about. That'll be when we get back. Okay. All right, we're back with Professor Valli Vardini, who is a professor of physics and uh, would you say material science and, and is your specialty? Um, not necessarily, but um, I deal a lot with materials, that's for sure. Yes. So I'm a junk professor in uh, material science and engineering, mm-hmm. and I have been until recently a junk professor in electrical engineering. Okay. So a condensed matter physicist is in between material science, physics, and electrical engineering. Yeah, that's a lot of fields to to kind of combine together. How so? How would you describe um, the more groundbreaking research that you and your team of folks have done over the years. I mean, what I've read about mostly is the or OLEDs, organic um, light emitting diodes. Um, would you say that's the biggest the, the biggest area of research, or how 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 would you describe that? Um, most people uh, know about uh, inorganic semiconductors, silicon, Silicon Valley. Mm-hmm. Um, gallium arsenide and, uh, and other semiconductors that bought Nobel Prizes and uh, are good for application, transistors, uh, field effect transistors and other gadgets. But um, in 1982, I had, uh, I remained, I was at Brown University at that time and my advisor uh, rest in peace, Professor Jan Tautz, who was National Academy of Science, went to Max Planck Institute and left me behind to take care of his group for a half a year, where he went to Germany and I stayed in Providence, Rhode Island, with his group. And I had the opportunity to meet uh, Professor uh, Ellen Higer. He was at that time um, in Pennsylvania. He's a Nobel Prize laureate in chemistry. Mm-hmm. He became Nebus no, in chemistry. And he came give gave a talk at Brown University, a colloquium. And uh, I fell in love with organic semiconductors because he he was a guy that a person, one of the three, that invented the field of organic semiconductors. Hmm. And so from nineteen eighty two until these days, very close to the end, um, maybe thirty seven years. I am in this field of organic semiconductors, 
And uh, people say, well, I mean, you are in the same field so so long, probably you are stagnant. But it's not true. Uh, it's like taking a bus from one uh, station to the other. The first station was doping of organic semiconductors and uh, batteries. The second sta station was uh, something else. The second, the third station was nonlinear optics. The fourth station and so on. Station and for each station I had to learn the field. Mm -hmm. The same thing with uh, light emitting diode. It was maybe the fifth station of my career in organic semiconductors and, uh, I, and it, I didn't know anything about light emitting diode. Mm -hmm. So I had to start from scratch. What is light emitting diode? How do they do it and so on? And then to adopt it in organic light emitting diode. Same thing with photovoltaic. I didn't know photovoltaic. I mean, I, I know what photovoltaic means and because I give lecture on photovoltaic, but not specifically what, how to get the uh, to to improve the efficiency and so on. So for me, it was completely uh, new, and uh, I, I I was never I have been never um, bored. Mm -hmm. It's the same semiconductors, but different application. And so next next application was field defect transistor. I, I what transistor field defect? What is this? Mm -hmm. And then uh, when you go in and uh, to characterize transistors and to build, uh, to engineer transistors, then you see things that you don't uh, see before. And then uh, um, I had luck that I started the field of organic spintronics. That means uh, gadgets that, uh, that are based on spin of electron rather than uh, charge of electron. This was uh, 2002, and then 2004 too. And uh, so I created a field together with other people, of course. Mm -hmm. And um, the field is still growing, and it's called organic spintonics. Can you describe what the promise is or how spintonics are being used? Uh, mm. Yes. Um, <clears throat> um, everyday life, you use electricity. And the electricity is based on uh, on charge. Either electrons or uh, or positive charges called holes. But uh, but the charge uh, you um, communicate by uh, by moving charges. Of course, the charges don't go to your ear by phone, mm -hmm. but they move, and then they move other charges and so on and that the wave comes to your phone, and mm -hmm. so on. Now communication is by uh, satellites. But, um, and if you if you are stuck with charges and you want to minimize um, gadgets uh, to, to, for application, then uh, there is a, a rule, a law called Moore law. Mm -hmm. That every two years, uh, uh, the, you, there is a change of one order of magnitude in dimension. And so sooner or later, you come to a dimension of uh, maybe tens of nanometer. Nanometer is 10 to minus 9. That means 1 over uh, 100,000 of 1 million, whatever. And that's directly related to computing power, correct? Yeah. Like as Moore's law is is the unfolding, gadget. everything gets smaller, smaller, smaller. Yes, and, and then more, and more powerful. And more powerful, yeah. And therefore you can use your uh, telephone or whatever, mm -hmm. or other gadgets. So everything is to be miniaturized. But then you come to a point where um, it's so small that, uh, that the heat will... Uh, will not let you to become smaller because, well, you need to communicate and uh, you, everything by uh, thermodynamic laws uh, has dissipation. Mm -hmm. And dissipation, that means heat. And so the heat associated with, uh, with a function of a small, uh, a miniature uh, circuit will kill it. Mm -hmm. 
So even though that you you have a lot of uh, you invest a lot of uh, um, effort in order to cool it, but uh, but it comes to a point where uh, it's it's futile. You cannot cool it anymore, mm. and so now you have to invent another way to communicate, and another way to uh, for the information to flow from one place to another uh, in order to overcome this dimension and to, to make it smaller or faster mm-hmm. and uh, this is by spin so it's another property of the electron it is not charged but but uh, it's related with uh, the ability of the electron to be magnetized wow. so you magnetize the electron either up or down so it's like uh, a binary, zero and one. Mm-hmm. So the electron now it's up and down. But now, since uh, uh, you have electrons that are um, polarized up and electrons that are polarized down, immediately you multiply by a factor of two all the communications channels. Yeah. Because now you can have a current with electrons with polarized up and a current with electrons polarized down, and sometimes they interact, sometimes not. Hmm. And so spintronics is, uh, but now transforms, it transforms. Uh, it started uh, maybe 25 years ago, and Nobel Prize in spintronics was given already maybe uh, eight years ago hmm. to a French and German guys. And so uh, to use the spin of the electron in order to to do the same thing with the charge with those before. So now we have, instead of uh, charge flow, we have spin flow. Mm-hmm. And not necessarily by charge, because spin can be, can move faster than charge. Yeah, wow. By a different way. So does that translate into devices we use today? So yes. you, like you, yes, yes. USB, does that? Yes, yes. Really, wow. I mean, Motorola and IBM, I uh, started to use uh, Spintronics, I mean, maybe t- 12 years ago. They have a gadget called Spin Valve, mm-hmm. or Spin Transfer Talk, and all kinds of, uh, of gadgets that are associated with spin. That's amazing. So this was a complete change of field for me and for other people in organic. So the whole field of flash memory came from Spintronics? Uh, I'm not the whole field, but a lot of it. Wow. That's amazing, and so that and that was pioneered at the University of Utah in the early two thousands. So. Uh, not and so fast. <laughs> Pioneer in organic. When organic. Organic spintronics. Okay, and yeah. the difference between organic and traditional is traditional silicone based. Organic is is uh, carbon based, correct? Carbon based, yeah. Yeah, and and if I understand correctly. The advantage of carbon-based is it's cheaper, easier to produce. Is that and environmental friendly? Yeah, silicon is not environmental friendly. Yeah, and so when you buy an organic LED television, yeah, you you can eat it later. <laughs> <laughs> you can go compost it in your backyard. <laughs> uh, that's good. Um, so. I, I mean, the way the progression of physics and technology has gone. It seems like a lot of the research that goes on in the universities has has a applicable function within a five year period of of producing new technology. Um, but is there is there a lot of much research going on that that could be one day truly groundbreaking, to, truly revolutionary, like what? Maxwell did with his equations are you, is there a horizon you see where there's research that's just starting or that started a while ago that could absolutely fundamentally change the way we look at the at the universe sure uh, <clears throat> I don't know if you are familiar with uh, uh, quantum computers I mean that's uh, a, a new way a fantastic way to improve uh, technology that we haven't even uh, seen the tip of the iceberg. 
is that kind of, is that research happening in the U or is uh, it? Yeah, research happening in the U too. Yeah, I'm it's everywhere. it's basically just the I team. mean uh, DOE and uh, well funding agencies in general put a lot of money now into it. And it's basically the idea that of of having co- computers operate on a quantum in a different scale. way, completely different way. Yeah. Can you can you describe it in a in a nutshell? I mean, I think I know what quantum means, but how do you compute at the quantum level? Well, um, first off, uh, in uh, in regular computers, um, the bits of regular computers are either one or zero, mm-hmm. binary. But uh, if you have a quantum computer, the bits there can be can have infinite uh, possibilities. Can you imagine? All the possibility between zero and one. Hmm. All the numbers between zero and none. <laughs> <laughs> so what are those numbers? <laughs> Imaginary well, numbers? No, all the numbers. Point one, point one oh, five, okay. point, so point you, two, point two five, point two one, whatever. All yeah, the fraction between zero fractions. and one. Okay. Well, this is simply putting it. Yeah, but there is an infinite number of numbers infinite between number. zero and one of these fractions. So can you yeah. imagine in a bit? <laughs> So you you now you beat uh, the, the the smallness that you need the tiny not by uh, by by spintronics or by another way but you beat it in a completely different way uh, those uh, uh, bits that in uh, that can be zero and one in uh, in in regular computer now they are called qubits in uh, quantum computer. Q is from quantum, mm-hmm. quantum bits, and then you can have any 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 numbers or between zero and one or. Hmm. And, uh, so what? So, so in a in a small bit, you can put a lot of information. So the what is the promise then that we could put just the entire world's knowledge in something the size of a quarter or? Well, I mean, uh, that's very, it's a simple way to look at it. But, uh, yeah, I mean, uh, the miniaturization is uh, it's fantastic now. You don't need, in order to build a computer, you don't need a uh, zillion, a zillion of uh, bits. Now you have only 100. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, uh, in 100 bits, you can, uh, you can have information that... Uh, of the whole earth, so the computers, whole history of computers earth. could could completely be miniaturized so that they could be put in your in your body and your bloodstream and take care of cancer if it comes up. Is that is that another application? Well, this quantum computer won't solve the problems of the world, but uh, it's just uh, a way to miniaturize the information mm-hmm. to to to. To solve the problem of uh, co- continuing miniaturizing and faster and so on, this is one way. The other way is in communication. Now, um, if you commute with, say, defense, if you commute with a satellite and uh, you want to see where the enemy is, the satellite uh, give you information about that. The enemy actually can uh, intercept and can listen to this communication. But if you do it by quantum computers, that means here is a quantum com- uh, whatever machine, then uh, each time that the enemy uh, intercepts, you can feel it. Hmm. You can actually know that the, you were intercepted. No kidding. Wow. Because they can detect on the other side that they, yes. they communicated I mean, uh, it? That, that the information is lost automatically. Oh, wow. So it's not it's not communicated via an EM wave or in the traditional way an EM wave is communicated. No. <laughs> it's huh. maybe a traditional way to to overcome the distance, mm-hmm. but it's not a traditional way to get to the real information to encode the data. And so even if the enemy will uh, listen to, uh, to to this channel, whatever, um, it, and um, he won't be able to get the information out. 
because it'll you be... You will know that there's communication in this channel, but he won't be able to get information out. The minute that he gets information out, the information is burned. Really? Can you begin to describe how that, how that would be possible? Stop it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, well, in, in quantum mechanics, um, well, I don't know if many many readers or listeners will uh, will get to it. But in quantum mechanics, uh, there is uh, it's not only numbers, but it's uh, complex numbers. So there is a phase mm-hmm. associated with them, and. Uh, um, if uh, if two uh, situations um, are coupled quantum mechanically, we call them uh, um, I forgot, but uh, entanglement. Entern- they are entangled. Entanglement. They are entangled uh, in quantum mechanics. The phase, their phase are they they know each other by the phase, and uh, the phase now it's it's enormous. I mean it's. Uh, you can imagine it's between zero and 360 mm-hmm. degrees, but you can divide it much more. Mm-hmm. And so there's a lot of opportunities for the phase to be different. And so entanglement, they have the same phase, or the phase is connected. And so once, so um, in order to get information, you, you take, uh, say, uh, the launcher and the detector, far away where they are still entangled. Mm-hmm. So this is very different than quantum computer itself. Mm-hmm. Is a computer, is, now we are talking about entanglement and communication, not on quantum computers. Yeah. And so now uh, they are still entangled and they, are, they feel the phase. So if you come and disturb it, the phase is disturbed. Hmm. And so immediately you can feel that uh, somebody has, in, has intruded. And you're able to just follow the phase, and if it's intercepted... Yeah, it's not just, the phase. You can then, just kill uh, it. The information is lost. Wow, that's something. We're talking... So let's summarize. We jump from quantum computer to yeah. communication. Yeah. And and as you, as you see this field develop, um, are we in something like a... A cold war with with China in developing quantum computers because if they beat us to this technology back, just th- just the way you described when Sputnik came out and we were in a space race with the with the Russians, if they happen to progress and develop this technology a lot faster than we can, is it possible that they could start a cyber warfare that we couldn't win? Bingo. Big yeah. Bingo. Bingo. Yeah. So therefore, the, uh, all of the defense agencies and uh, put a lot of money into it. Whoever would have the technology to communicate without other people knowing about it is a winner in a battle. How many years off do you think we are? You know, it's, it's, it's very different. It's very difficult to, to see the future. You know how scientists uh, look at the future. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, I guess you don't. It's it's but we're not creating the same enthusiasm to this this problem like we did when we were given the challenge of Sputnik, are we? Yeah, the reason is that uh, everybody can see the moon. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, communication and quantum computers are something that you don't see. And so for, uh, for the vast majority of people, they uh, don't grasp what's going on. But this is number one problem now in, uh, in defense, my opinion, is mm. the communication. So you, you believe the Defense Department has to step up and possibly fund it's more research same, for this? We are in the situation. It's not exactly the same situation of the atomic bomb, but uh, we are because uh, communication is not destroying anything. Mm-hmm. But it's a weapon by itself. But but we are the same. I mean, wh- what happened to atomic bomb? Everybody knew. All the scientific community knew that uh, atomic bomb is possible. Mm-hmm. 
because physics uh, shows them. The physicists uh, uh, proving that uh, that Einstein relation of mass and energy is correct, and everybody knew that uh, it's coming. But uh, but I, I, everybody, I mean, all the countries were busy doing other things, <laughs> like fighting World War Two. But how do you? So back when the Manhattan Project started the scientific community was able to convince the political community that that was a that was a race we had to win yeah that's correct and if i'm not mistaken was it started under fdr the manhattan project and and they were able to convince him we have to do this because they saw the ravages of you know world war 2 and not only that but they saw that if we don't do it other people will do it yeah. How do you feel like the gap between the scientific and political community is <clears throat> No, now the gap is much smaller. It's much smaller. Yeah, I mean for example in, at NSF we have people uh, at NSF that go to the government and discuss with them and vice yeah. versa. So they And uh, I think in DOE is the same. Mm -hmm. And uh, the head of the DOE is nominated by uh, by the government. So those and people, many people giving out the funding, they're doing it in the right way. Yes. Yeah. And now we have DARPA. I don't know when DARPA started, but uh, but, uh, but it's specialized in uh, in science for the defense. Yeah. And and from what I hear, there's there's a lot of there's quite a few DARPA operations in in Utah in the West Desert. Do you, do you know anything about? Sure. I mean, I mean, I hear. That's where a speculation and conjecture come up, but from what I what I hear, that the, they are progressing science and capability of technology to a level beyond what we're aware of. It, do you do you buy that? Do you think that there's a there are some incredible spacecraft? I don't know like... anything about it. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and if you press on me, I still don't know anything about it. Yeah, I guess nobody does besides the people who are in the know. Yeah, even people that know won't tell you anything. So. Yeah. I mean, I tried to find out because, of course, everybody believes that Dugway Proving Grounds is the new Area 51. Or, or sure, the, I mean, Dugway Proving Ground. I, incidentally, uh, we have a group in physics department uh, that, that does astrophysics, and they measure uh, particles that fall on, on, on Earth. And they have detectors at Dugway Proving Ground. So they have a special uh, um, treatment to go through and so on and to, uh, to detect uh, particles that fall out of the sky. And you're, you're, some of your I'm students not, can use, those, use that I'm equipment? Not, but, uh, oh. but there are five people, now there are four, in physics departments that do that. Hmm. Maybe they can tell you more. Okay. <laughs> I know just from the traffic we get to our website, a lot of people type in Dugway Proving Grounds, aliens, and that sort of thing. And, you know, it's, it's, I guess it makes more people interested in, in physics and technology. And, but I, so kind of going back to the, you know, our, the initial question, like where we started with the space race and the, momentum that physics and technology and mathematics had behind it to win that space race and to achieve things we'd never we we so we could stay on the on the forefront of the world in in physics and technology do you feel like we've lost a lot of that momentum in yes. the last 20 years <clears throat> yes why has that happened well because uh a lot of our uh Graduate students uh, came from abroad, and they went back to abroad. Mm -hmm. So we lost this knowledge to other countries. Why are not Why are more Americans not interested in studying STEM? You no, know, that's a sixty-four thousand question. That's a completely. Is an you talk education. Um, this is very important uh, to indoctrinate uh, STEM. You know, mm -hmm. science and technology, into high school and uh, even before elementary school. 
and to um, breed the education and, and uh, imagination of uh, young people. Because you said you felt this call to adventure just by following what was happening in the areas of of science, and and you would you say your your impetus was largely the space program, or was it was it more you just saw that you could contribute to something significant in in science? No, at that time, uh, yeah, NASA and the space program were very nice, but uh, I was not uh, attracted to them. Yeah. I, uh, <clears throat> curiosity uh, was I was attracted to to other other things in science other than going to space. Mm-hmm. I was not attracted uh, to aliens and and visiting uh, some rocks that uh, <laughs> would take me one month to get them. Mm-hmm. I uh, was interested in something that I can do on Earth. And uh, at that time, elementary particles was the biggest thing in, uh, in physics. Not nuclear, but elementary particles. So, as you, as you, as you may know, uh, nuclear is based on uh, proton and, uh, and nuclei and electrons, beta decay, X-ray, and so on. But uh, when I grew up, uh, they could, uh, well, they, they saw that there are particles underneath the nucleus mm-hmm. that form the nucleus. Uh, not only that forms the protons, or not the protons itself, but but uh, there are sub sub uh, nuclei. Is there, uh, they are called elementary particles, mm-hmm. and so uh, those are omega and uh, all kind of other uh, Greek names that I don't want to go into it. And each time that uh, people find a new particle was was a great event in science. It's, it was like a, um, like a guy in the desert that uh, s- sees water. <laughs> All the science were after n- elementary particles. Hmm. And uh, this was great in, a di- in parallel to what NASA did. It was at, uh, in, uh, on Earth. And in addition, uh, you could see the particle with your own eyes uh, by uh, following the trajectories in a in a in a special uh, um, um, volume filled with uh, um, with uh, with va- va- vapor, and so when the particle goes through, you can you can see the trace. So you could see actually how one particle you can see only one trace, and then disperse into three. <laughs> wow. And uh, if you put magnetic field, then you could see whether they are charged positive, negative, or neutral. And so you could see with your own eyes. Hmm. I know uh, nothing about that. Yeah, yeah, so, I mean, these are elementary particles. And so while... And you can uh, you still can... Uh, th- th- this kind of physics is still going on, but in uh, super accelerators... And so it cost like a lot the, of money. Like the CERN, In CERN yeah. where they blast the particles <laughs> right. with the giant, massive right. uh, so I was attracted to that. Okay. Uh, but uh, when I uh, became a graduate student, uh, it, uh, this, uh, this area was solved, so to speak. Hmm. Uh, Gelman came in, he won a Nobel Prize in physics, and, uh, and solved it. They told us... Uh, they fill the puzzle where each particle will be. So I felt that there's nothing to be done because the uh, history uh, of elementary particles was so complete that until now we are fighting to see uh, what's behind it, what's above it. Or it was such a fantastic symmetric theory that... Uh, I didn't feel that I can contribute anymore. So I went to solid state or condensed matter. Hmm. And so back to 
kind of our culture today and why so many Americans choose art and psychology and what you might accurately describe as soft sciences, why, what could teachers do or parents do to, to get their kids to become more interested in math and technology? Well, math and science. I mean, kids are interested in technology and science fiction, but how do you get them interested, do you think, more in, into science? You have to <clears throat> to work on the intimidation. Uh, young people are intimidated by uh, by other people that know better than them, and so you have to um, put in them curiosity mm-hmm. that uh, would um, would fight against intimidation. So what if the other uh, the person uh, knows better? If I'm not intimidated to ask the right question, if my curiosity will uh, will be um, stronger than my intimidation, I will ask the question, and then I will know what other people know and know also better. So the That's main, really the main thing, in my mm-hmm. opinion, is that to uh, break the intimidation, mm-hmm. just tell them to ask questions, yeah, and not to be afraid to ask. And uh, so, I don't know about you, but um, when I was young, I asked zillions of questions all the time. <laughs> yeah. But uh, but my parents didn't say never no or stop it or whatever. They would uh, continue to explain things. And so, I find myself knowing more and more. So, I, But it was a feedback to them because then I, I asked less and less. <laughs> <laughs> And was your were your parents scientists in any way or mathematicians? Uh, no, no, they just tried my, to answer uh, your questions as best they could. Yeah, my my father was a high school teacher, hmm. and uh, my mother was a painter. Well, that's an interesting combo. Yeah, and when you look at the whole north end of campus, so engineering, chemistry, physics departments. I mean, it's obvious you notice that most of the students are Chinese, a lot are Indian. A lot of people come from other countries to go and take advantage of the free tuition, which I didn't even know about till till Golda started going to the U. And Golda be my my wife. Do do more international students know that if you study and get a master's or PhD, you can get free tuition it, internationally than they know about it here? Or what's the reason? Yeah. <clears throat> um, there are multiple reasons. Uh, one reason is America. People want to go to America. Mm-hmm. Uh, American dreams and so on. And so they will do anything to, to leave the country. It's the same as immigrants. I mean, immigrants come here because America dream. And so an easy way for a child to achieve it is to be good in in uh, math and science, and then to come to America without going through the border that everybody now talks about. Mm-hmm. And so they come here because they want to come here to the states. Yeah, and it's a great not European, but, uh, but other people, Chinese and Indian. This was the main reason, uh, say, uh, twenty years ago. Uh, Chinese came here to be in America, but and, and the Chinese government actually uh, encouraged it because they knew they are smart. <laughs> so they knew that not 100% of people will stay here. So even if it's uh, 80% we stay and 20% come back, this 20% will be enough to generate more and more and so on. And so, yeah, I mean, 30 years ago, um, if, if the physics department will get a uh, graduate student, say, a cadre of, uh, say, 20 people, out of them, uh, 15 will be Americans and five will be foreigners. Then about uh, 15 years ago, it was the other way around. Wow, really? 
Yeah, 15 uh, foreigners and five Americans. Hmm. And it turns out that now it came back to the to 30 years ago. That means now we have only five foreigners and 15 Americans. Oh, no kidding. No, no kidding. And yeah. the reason is that people realize that there are jobs <laughs> yeah. in engineering that can get, uh, get you started. And in addition, uh, foreign people... I realize they don't have to come to America to to get uh, an American dream. They can do it in China. Mm-hmm. There are very good universities there. And if they are really interested in science and engineering, they can stay there, get PhDs there, and they don't need us anymore. Do you think in the next 20 years, 20, 30 years, <clears throat> America will lose its position as being the forefront leader of the progression of science and technology? It's again, it's a, I mean, you were right in asking the question, look, I mean, in China there are so many that uh, because of the sheer numbers, they maybe, maybe are correct. I mean, they invest so much in science now that maybe in 15 to 20 people, 20 years, we lose the first place. Hmm. I mean, look at, uh, so Golda will tell you uh, to look at uh, a journal in physics. And look at it. Look at the titles and then the authors. And look at the family names of the authors. Then you can get an idea what's going on. Mm-hmm. Or, or Golda went to APS meetings, American Physical Society meetings. Mm-hmm. And uh, you look at the faces, I mean, there are many, many, many foreigners. Yeah. And uh, so now it, it's a blessing and uh, that, that uh, the, if the American people do not come to those uh, discipline, then uh, the foreigners will come and uh, many of them stay here and will push our uh, um, technology further. Yeah, you've got the CEO of Microsoft as an Indian guy. And now you have many technology companies that are run by Chinese people and Indians. And and it's like Americans are missing out. There's yeah, but definitely... on the other hand, uh, there is a bulletin for American Physical Society. It uh, it appears every every week. It's a journal of American Physical Society. And... Uh, Incidentally, uh, this week I look at, uh, there, there is a, an article about high school students that go to the Olympic Olympiad for uh, physics and mathematics. Oh, yeah, I covered that yeah. a long time ago. Yeah. And look at the picture of the high school kids that go to, now it's in Israel, uh, and the Olympic in physics. Mm-hmm. And so they uh, prepared them to go and maybe there are 30 people there, look at their faces. <laughs> <laughs> and then you realize that when you say Indian and Chinese, the high school students in America are Indians and Chinese, and they go. Yeah. They stay here. Yeah. So when you say America will lose uh, our first place and so on, what do you mean by that? The well, Indians if they're, are, yeah, Chinese if they're are, Indian, Chinese, Americans, sure. then great. Yeah. Yeah. So but, uh, we benefited from it. Yeah, that's true. So switching gears a bit, in in Golda's department, there were a few women, not many, but a few, but overwhelmingly physics and math and, and science is, is dominated by men because I, and, and I'm just kind of hypothesizing, but basically because it is so demanding, it's so rigorous. I mean, it requires, if you're going to get a PhD and you're going to go on, the time commitments to spending in, in the laboratory and, and reading all the research papers, it's just really demanding. What do you think, do you think there's anything that the greater scientific community can do to make more women attracted to doing science in this country? It's already happening I mean, uh, now we have uh, 
maybe 30 percent of our uh, undergraduates in physics are women. Wow, that I know. And, uh, well, in, in faculty we have maybe five out of, uh, out of 38. Hmm. But, uh, but in other, other department, and we are working on it, other department are much higher, maybe 10 out, out of 40. And so it's already happening. We don't have to worry about it, in my opinion, now. It's not a problem anymore. The, the situation is the same as uh, American uh, soccer for women. Yeah. I mean, now it started really slow. But then, then uh, nowadays, I don't think you can stop it anymore. But do you, th do you think women can find that work-life balance, like have children, be a professor, and, and balance everything out? Well, it's the same thing with athleticism. I mean, those women, well, they are younger than uh, women that give birth, but, but some of them uh, gave birth and still they are very uh, active in athleticism, like Serena Williams. Mm -hmm. And so it's possible, but it's tougher. And you you do have to sacrifice a bit if you're yeah. a woman to be able to try to for, manage. Uh, have for a Serena Williams, she has to sacrifice one year. Yeah. And for those women in soccer, and probably two. Do the women who are in the program do they are they able to have you know families and children uh, yeah, and stuff? Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, out of uh, women that I, that I know in the department, uh, they have children and. Yeah. Yeah, well, I know that um, we could go into it some other time, but but Golda, when she left the UK and she came back, she was like at the um, apex of where you want to be if you're a physicist. And, uh, you know, then coming back where the working under a different research professor and working under, not you, unfortunately, anymore it was more it seemed to that it was more less on the cutting edge and more just sort of doing something that she knew would get funding or that the, or that her her professor who had received the funding knew that would he could sustain students and maintain a level of funding but it wasn't on the cutting edge are, are there a lot of university programs that are kind of i won't say spinning their wheels but not on the forefront, but doing research that perhaps other a lot of us other institutions are further along in doing, where they're not feeling that push that like they're on the cutting edge. Is that is that just commonplace in the university system? I I, I don't know about it. Yeah, yeah, it's a, it's a, something I I don't understand well enough really to ask in detail about it. Everybody that get funding. Is on cutting edge of research. Otherwise, funds or grants won't come to him. Oh yeah. Yeah, you have to say you're doing yeah. something I mean, new, right? You no, write a proposal. I, mean, I don't know if you know how proposals are written. You you take it takes one month of your life to write a proposal. Yeah. I mean the correct proposal. You have preliminary results. You submit it. You compete against other people from other universities that write proposals the same as you. Mm -hmm. And then somebody or committee or whatever they have there chose, uh, they choose, uh, say, 10% of the proposal to, to get funded. They cannot choose something that is not on cutting edge. Yeah. So everybody that gets grants is on cutting edge of research. Yeah, and, and as, so, as far as... But the... there are now things that, uh, that were different 30 years ago. And this is uh, called the interdisciplinary research. Oh, uh -huh. And interdisciplinary research, there are um, big groups of people from various universi universities or in the same university from various uh, departments. And when they get together to get a grant, mm, many times the movers of uh, of those big programs are very are excellent, mm -hmm. but the people that come behind them are not as excellent as the movers. I see. So if you get a 
an individual grant or two people get a grant, it, it's absolutely top notch. Mm-hmm. But if you have a big group that get a grant, if uh, you look with a microscope, then you can find where, where are the movers. And sometimes there are only maybe 20% of, uh, of, the, of, the, of the whole group that are movers. The other one are followers. It seems like that would be problematic and interdisciplinary because if you're trying to do something novel and you're combining a lot of different disciplines together, you're trying to break new ground by getting people to think outside of their box and, and perhaps it's going to just end up in, you know, nothing, you know. No, I, I don't share this, uh, this thought because <clears throat> when you meet people who from other discipline, then uh, you get fertilized. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so together, when you stay in one, one room and uh, each has an, a different point of view, you can, uh, you can solve problems that you cannot solve by doing individual. Well, with, with your research, a lot of what you do concerns not only physics, but chemistry, right? So yeah, and you, you would have never gotten where you are without chemistry. So is, uh, yeah. And, and so with what you're doing now and with uh, what Alan Heger is, is pushing and Golda worked on before we went to Cambridge, the organic, uh, the promise of organic, uh, solar cells, is that still move getting, gaining momentum and pushing forward? Yeah. Um, uh... It started like, uh, I think, 15 years ago or whatever. And uh, it's, still, it's still going strong. Each time another invention comes through and pushes the uh, quantum efficiency, not the, the efficiency of solar cell to be higher and higher. But then something uh, miraculously have happened. And it saved my career because... Uh, as you know, I'm uh, almost 32 years at the University of Utah. And you can, in, uh, after, after uh, say, uh, after a generation, you, you kind of uh, use your resources and, uh, and your imagination in this particular field that you are working on. But then uh, something miraculous happened. Uh, materials were invented that are hybrids between organic and inorganic. And mm. they are called hybrid organic inorganic semiconductors. So mm. in the building blocks, they're organic and inorganic. So there's and silicone and carbon the, both? Or? In, yeah. Huh. It's silicon and carbon both, if you like to look at it. So it's carbon and lead. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> or carbon and uh, tin, or whatever. In, a, in hydrogen and so on. Mm-hmm. And so called, uh, they are called now hybrid semiconductors. And five years ago was an explosion. People uh, saw that uh, the um, solar cell made out of, uh, of this new and exciting semiconductor can get up to the efficiency of silicon solar cell. No kidding. So then my whole program was... Uh, revolutionize hmm. and rejuvenation I, I felt that I don't want to retire hmm. because now the PhD and uh, the beginning of my career was in, in an inorganic semiconductor then my whole career in, uh, as a faculty member was organic semiconductor so now this <laughs> new kid in the, in the neighborhood came with organic, inorganic semiconductor, I cannot quit. Can't possibly retire Because now. Uh, mm. all my knowledge that I had before, now it's compressed into solving this problem. Wow. So and now is that the efficiency so is about 20, 22%. Wow. Did you know that? Of uh, solar cell <laughs> based on it. That's pretty great. And also you can make them by solution spin casting. <laughs> Gold is nodding her head. <laughs> so yeah, it's the it's same thing as organic, but it's organic, inorganic. And the carrier mobility is higher, and uh, all, all the things are higher. 
So when will they be on rooftops? I don't know. Yeah. But uh, but the the feeling is that a combination of this plus silicon will be the winner. Hmm. That means if you have tandem tandem cells of this uh, perovskites, what we call it perovskites, hybrid perovskites and silicon together, mm -hmm. then we can break, uh, you know, this this is uh, the true goal. We can break 30%. And if I understand correctly, why organic solar cells show so much promise is the cost of manufacture is far cheaper than silicone, correct? Yeah, yeah they, they have yeah. their niche. Yeah. I mean, they, you, put, you can put uh, nowadays organic se solar cell on the, on the window. So the window will be semi-transparent, but uh, it will generate electricity. And so I am a consultant for a company that, that do that, put windows on uh, sky <laughs> skyscraper. No kidding. There are so many windows there. It's a, it's a, it's pity not to, I mean, to waste this kind of uh, area. Yeah. What company is that? Uh, well, it it uh, evolves into many, uh, into other companies and so on. So nowadays it's called uh, something with window, organic, and solar cell together. Mm -hmm. Solar or something and solar window or whatever. And I think I saw that you uh, you were part of a company that spun out of Cambridge in the UK. And um, I was. Are you? You're not part mm -hmm. of that company anymore. No. But also Plextronics. Does that? Yeah, I was. Yeah. So it's it's kind of cool at the U and what with what you've done. It's, I mean, the applicability to to roll out new products from your research and what your team has done with the patents that you have, you, you're seeing these things manifest into industry, right? Yeah, I mean, uh, if you are lucky and you find something that it's worth patenting, then uh, the university actually encourage it. Yeah, that's cool. So the University of Utah in particular, they uh, encourage all the scientists to see a way to patent what they do, because the university wins. Yeah, do they do they receive a portion of the patent funding and? Is well, that what my uh, the pa unfortunately the patent that patents that I uh, I was involved with were not picked up by companies. Hmm. So the university hasn't win yet. Okay. However. Uh, the university won a lot of money from uh, overhead that I bring that uh, let me patent what I have. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if you know, but the university overhead is uh, about now 52.5% of the money that I get. So if I get X, then I, uh, I need to give 52% of this X, uh, not for one over one plus 52 percent to the university a third of the money more more than a third of the of the grant that i get i give them give to the university yeah that's a great benefit. so the university actually takes the money and uh, put it in wha whatever they like and uh, how do you think that uh, the school of uh, music or ballet or uh, humanities and so on it goes over all the way to the over my the blood. south end of the campus <laughs> <laughs> my effort and golda effort when she was there so they can take the money for that that's being generated from the north end of the campus and move it to the south if they Whenever want they whatever like. they want wow i this is a difficult question and, and maybe we don't have to go here if you don't want to but with the rise of sociology psychology and so many people students americans studying i mean these kind of soft sciences and political science i mean as you get into the economics you're getting into more of a real science do you feel like that as in general americans are not as well educated or able to think in a in a logical manner to 
process the world in a more logical way as as we were once once able to i don't know for me american is not what uh, used to be 100 years ago there are many uh, people that come from other countries not from europe and so the word america now you have to to, to look at it differently. Those people that come from other countries have different uh, opinion and different mentality that, uh, that would benefit America. And uh, so when you say American, what do you mean? I mean, if you, if you, if you say uh, Paisan in, uh, in the Midwest, that's a different story. But if you say uh, high school kids in New York or California, it's a different story. So Utah used to be uh, more of a uh, Midwestern. Mm-hmm. And so, but, but nowadays, I mean, with the influx of uh, foreigners, it's completely different than it was 30 years ago when I came here. Well, I, I just see such a different mentality in immigrants who've come here from other places who still are into the idea of, of make, realizing their American dream contrasted with some of my cousins and other third, fourth generation Americans who just kind of want to be artists <laughs> and take it easy or want to be psychologists or to just kind of take the easy path. And I, I mean, and a lot of people, I've, I kind of like the quote. Um, it's, it goes something like, I busted my butt to be a, uh, a tradesman so my child could be a poet. And um, I can't remember where that came from or how it was said, but do you, do you think like the intellect, the overall in- intellect of average Americans is, is declining because there's not enough emphasis in science and I math? I don't think so. <clears throat> yeah. No, I can see enthusiasm in uh, people that come visit me from high school or Elementary not, because, you know, it's too early, but high school uh, kids in Utah are very enthusiastic on, on science, and uh, I can see it. I mean, the 32 years that I'm in the university, in physics department, uh, the undergraduate population uh, grew from, uh, I say, 50 overall in four years, 50. To 250. Yeah. So it's not, uh, it did not happen uh, like that, but it, it took some time. Now we have uh, between 250 and 300 undergraduate students that declared physics as a major. Yeah. That's it's great. very good. So the, the high school students now, or the high school kids now, they, they know the way around. The gadgets that they have in their hand teach them that where where the technology can uh, benefit them. Yeah. Yeah, I guess I get they, I get uh, a uh, little ask Alexa question. I mean, then they can feel that the technology can help, and they want to be part of it. Yeah. Yeah, I guess I I can feel it because after I graduated from high school and I took the easy road, I kind of it was kind of a wake up call when I realized how dumb I was. Well, don't know if you wake up. <laughs> yeah, so she she helped me actually don't, totally did wrote, made me realize how dumb I was trying to trying to pick up math when I was like twenty three years old and learn algebra and trigonometry and good for you. But yeah, I did it. I mean, I I and I studied com- some computer science and. But I, um, I think the greatest benefit I got from studying math was just thinking about the world and everything I was doing in a more logical way, rather than letting all of the distractions and manipulations influence my decisions, realizing everything should have an order of operations that you do in your life. And you need to start at point A and go to point B and C and D and knowing. Yeah, yeah, that's... That the motto or the flag of the physics department: learn physics and then go anywhere. Yeah. Because uh, we will teach you how to think logically, mm-hmm. and then you can go to anywhere because your mind was is set to think logically. 
Yeah. Absolutely right. So yeah. out of uh, 300 undergraduate, I don't think that more than a quarter of them will continue in physics. But then they'll have that mode of yeah. thinking that yeah, will they, uh, go to law lives. school and be patent law and medical and pharmacy and whatever. Made in Utah Festival director. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Look at Golda. <laughs> yeah. She's thinking probably logical, no? Yeah, she's pretty good at thinking about and how to run our festivals. That's for sure. Yeah, well, I think that feels like a good place to wrap it up. Thanks for so thanks so much Grace, for being thank on. Thank you for inviting me. It was a pleasure. Yeah, that was fun. Thanks for watching the Utah Story Show. I really appreciate it. So I got to tell you about a massive, huge upcoming event we have coming, Made in Utah Festival. It's our fourth year doing it. Uh, this festival is incredible because it's a giant party where you can actually drink beer, enjoy amazing food, buy from local vendors, and also enjoy local music on two sound stages. We describe it as a farmer's market on steroids. It's incredible. My wife puts it on. She's been working with her team for months on this festival. You just have to see it to believe it. It's amazing. Um, at the Gateway, August 24th and 25th, I would check out madeinutahfest.com for more information on that. Um, also, I want to tell you, uh, we have a few members, actually. Our Utah Stories membership is a new thing we're offering. We don't want to fill this podcast full of ads. Instead, we really want to bring to you um, local important issues that really matter, that affect the quality of life in Utah. We believe strongly that journalism, local journalism, serves a key component to maintaining our sovereignty, making people aware of the buying choices that they make. And if, and if we can help you buy local by picking up this book, we all become stronger if we don't fill our communities full of chain stores. If you become a Made in Utah, Utah Stories member, it's $99 a year or $9.99 per month. We will send you to our VIP section of our Made in Utah Festival where you can sample some of the best entrees made by local chefs. We've, we're partnering with these amazing local chefs. They're going to come and put on a demonstration of how they make these, these entrees, and then you get to try them. And then also you get to enjoy craft cocktails made by local distilleries and local bartenders, made in Utah, craft cocktails, beer, at the VIP section. We're going to send you there. It's a uh, $45 value. It comes included with your Made in Utah membership. And uh, and again, that's $99 a year or $9.99 per month. Visit utahstories.com to order that and click on the member uh, button there. Um, so I wanted to also mention we're celebrating our 10-year anniversary of printing this magazine. It's quite amazing. I uh, reluctantly went into print as a programmer. I was very much a digital dude, and but I produced uh, the content with other writers and really got interested in providing in-depth local journalism. We thought when we launched this magazine 10 years ago that if we did three issues, that would be amazing. I would put all three in frames and just put them up somewhere special and say this was my attempt to be in print. Ten years later, I can't believe it's been that long. It's it, We've actually survived. And despite what everybody says about print being dead and dying, uh, amazingly, it actually works. When you put an ad in a magazine, when you put an ad in this magazine, people come to your business and people call because we tell everybody the only way we produce this magazine and the only way it works is by you, the readers, picking one up and visiting all the amazing advertisers you find inside. That's um, called advertising, and it actually works in other places besides Facebook and Google. You can go figure. So anyway, um, big thanks to you for making it possible. It would never be possible without you, and I don't know if it's you in particular, but our readers who pick up the book every month and visit our advertisers. So... Um, i got to read an, our uh, ad now. So this episode of Utah Stories is brought to you by Curry Pizza. Curry Pizza is absolutely incredible. You've heard of diners, drive-ins, and dives. Just after, they've only been open for like two years. 
Guy Fieri uh, had to come, or Fieri uh, had to come and visit them and check out their pizza because it's like the best of Indian food put on a pizza with a non crust. It's absolutely amazing. You gotta come and try it. I would just fly to Utah if you're from some other state just to try curry pizza. It's incredible. Um, <clears throat> all right, so you can uh, follow Utah Stories on Instagram. You can subscribe to our YouTube channel. Or probably the best way to follow and keep track of what we're doing is to subscribe to our weekly newsletter, our Utah Stories newsletter. We also put out a Made in Utah newsletter and Utah Bites by Ted Scheffler. Subscribe to our newsletters by visiting utahstories.com or find the membership information there and become a member. Production assistance for the Utah Story Show is provided by Connie Lewis and Louie Lewis. The Utah Story Show is produced by Utah Stories, copyright 2019.